Thank you, Nancy. Good morning. morning. Turn me down just a little bit. You might wake up the back row. Is it the monitors? Yeah, there we go. Okay, is that better? That's better. Okay. A couple of quick announcements as we get started today. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, start out by saying thank you so much to everybody who came out uh, yesterday, and particularly thank you to all of those who worked so hard uh, to make, I mean, if you were here, what a display of food. Wow. And uh, thank you to all those ladies who worked in the kitchen and did all that hard work. We appreciate that so much. And uh, everybody had a good time. The music was fantastic. Thanks to Billy and thanks to uh, Kevin and all the people that uh, provided that. Uh, We had two solid hours of wow. It was just really good. Everything from the Peanuts music to the spiritual stuff, it was was just really good. I I was... uh, taken back by all of it. Thank you so much. And to all of you who uh, contributed toward the gift for Dawn and I, uh, thank you so much for your generosity and your kindness and all the kind words and the cards. And um, I had a little bit of a tear every now and then because it just kind of got to me. Uh, I went home and I said to Dawn, gosh, if I was half as good as they think I am, I'd be pretty good. (laughs) So... uh, but anyway, I'm really, I'm really not that great, so I, I appreciate, but I appreciate your thinking so. And uh, to all the people that, oh my, I, I almost had a heart attack right there in the, in the aisle because I, I looked up and there was Gail Wigner from Michigan. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh. And uh, Mary knew this but kept it from me. And uh, I think she's the only one that knew that the Wigners and the Augers were, were coming and uh, Gail's brother Larry was here and his wife Shirley and... Uh, uh, we just had so many, so many people. And, and of course, the one who wins the prize, I don't know if Michigan's further than Texas or not, but it, it's close. So, and, and Don Pendley, who will be playing for you in just a minute, uh, came all the way from Texas. And uh, I just had, we had a lot of people from my loving board uh, that I've been on for a number of years. And they came, and, and Dana, who's the executive director, and Julia, who's the assistant director, who sang. And a couple people, I think, were here from the uh, Martin Luther King Committee. Uh, it, was, it was just great, just great. I, I couldn't have asked for more. Uh, when I got home, I was so tired, I was wishing I'd ask for less. Uh, but no, it was, it was really good. So thank you. Thank you so much to, to all of you. It is, a, it is a great place, and it's a great place because of Jesus. It's a great place because of our faith that we share together. And it's a great place because of the hard work that a, a good core of people do here. Uh, everything from Leslie and, and the crew from the... Uh, uh, Baby pantry, the infant toddler pantry, and I know is here, and uh, we, I, you know, the uh, I, I love this. I got to tell you this. Don't don't repeat this out in the community, but uh, I, I have to laugh that these churches have put in their ads. We are we are uh, inclusive, we are open and affirming. You know, like nobody else is, right? I mean, how can you be more open? to everyone and loving to everyone and inclusive than we are. We had uh, two African Americans that I love, both of them participate in the music. We had a Jewish fellow participate in the music. We had Ina, who's Jewish, come and represent the the, uh, singers. You know, uh, we had a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. How do you let those guys in here? So, I mean, you know, if you believe, if you believe and you, you love, you know, you're, you're welcome here. Jesus excluded no one, you know. That doesn't mean you have to agree with everything they think or whatever, uh, and, and I don't. But uh, we, we can love one another, and uh, there's, there's that bond that uh, we can form together. And, and I, I think we have that. And uh, uh, I thought last night was a, another good instance of that. So you'll never see in our ads, as long as I'm here, open and affirming or inclusive or any of those catch buzzwords or woke. Uh, you'll never see a rainbow flag out front. You, don't, you know, don't brag about it. Don't talk about it. Just do it do it. And, and that's pretty much what we do. And uh, we, we try our best. Let me, let me tell you that the flowers today uh, are uh, Candy DeGarmo and her husband 
are having an anniversary. I don't know how she has any energy to have an anniversary, 27 years of marriage after all the work she did on last, last night, but a lot of what happened was, was candy, and uh, she, did, she did a great job. And Al made the programs, and uh, I, I, I don't know if he was an indentured servant or a willing participant, but <laughs> thank, thanks, Al. He did a great job. So and happy anniversary to both of you. I hope you have a happy day. Um, let's see, what else? Um, we will have communion today. Then the next time we'll have communion is the second Sunday in July, which is the 9th. Uh, because on the second, we'll celebrate patriotic, and I like to separate those two out. And so we'll, we'll do it on the ninth. Um, that's about it. And I want to thank my family who are filling the back row. It's kind of pathetic that the preacher's family is in the back row, but anyway. My, my daughter, Cindy, and her husband, Bill, and my granddaughter, my beautiful granddaughter, Bronwyn, who's of my volleyball star. Uh, it's back there. And Danielle, who you've prayed for many times, uh, uh, they, well, they weren't, th- when we were, let's see, we were up in Michigan when they were on the missionary trail down in Paraguay for eight years, and then they were in a, in a worse place than Paraguay, they were in Minnesota. Uh, so... Well, yeah, it's more dangerous in Minnesota, at least at least in uh, in the major cities, yeah. And uh, now they're, they're pastoring in uh, Hastings, Nebraska, and uh, they have a beautiful church out there. And uh, my son-in-law Scott's a great preacher and does a great job. And um, couldn't be here today because he's 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 smarter than his father-in-law Kevin. You know where he is. He leaves after church today to go up to northern Minnesota fishing. Yeah. And who has the brains in this family? Now, his father and his brother, who's also a pastor, is, are going fishing. So. But, but we snuck Danny away from him, and we've got Danielle with us today. So lots of good friends. The, the, I knew we weren't going to have a lot of people here because you were, they were here yesterday, and God, God knows you can't go to church two days in a row within 12 hours. <laughs> Your whole right side might sober up, you know. But anyway, uh, we're, we're glad that you came and, and happy that you're here. And we've got the Wigners and, and the Augers holding down that back row. And we've got my family holding down that back row. And then we've got the Saints in the front here. <laughs> I, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to tell you this quickly, too, before we get started, that the... Um, uh, prayer shawl ministry, which you know is near and dear to my heart, I, and I, I can't even remember whose whose idea it was. It wasn't mine. Uh, uh, started this, and it, it's just been so wonderful. And the the I wish you could have been with me. The times I've been to the hospital, and people have had these uh, draped across themselves, sitting in a chair by the bed, or or there in the bed with them, and uh, uh, we've we we know that people have actually had these with them when they've passed away, and they've been buried with them. Uh, it's just, uh, and the notes we get, and and the love and affection that comes back is is phenomenal. And uh, I, I've thanked her many times, but I thank her again today. Penny Stinton does so much work on this, and there. Are others as well, but Penny's kind of our key person with this, and she gave me this uh, report today uh, that she keeps a record of every single person who, who gets one and when they got it and so forth, and who requested it, and uh, these aside, these are not on the list yet, 391 people as of fi- uh, 528. 391 people. And so this is, there's five going to go out today. So 396 people have uh, been blessed by these uh, prayer shawls. And that's thank you so much to Penny. Okay. And I did thank you uh, for all the hard work you did. And you did. You, you have no idea. Uh, I'm going to embarrass him, but you have no idea how much work he has to do to make these things happen. Uh, all, all those people you heard yesterday, a lot of them, he had to rewrite the score for them. So I, I'm probably using. 
Well, I'm, I'm trying to use. I'm probably using the wrong terminologies, but right. he had to rekey it or whatever uh, for their voice and their their level and so forth. That's a lot of work. And then he practices with them. They were in here at three o'clock, and some of them he uh, practicing yesterday, and some of them he had practiced with during the week before. Uh, and he was in, in contact over the phone with them. It's a, a lot of work. It's not what you see. It's not like preaching where you just get up and talk for 15 minutes. Uh, it, it's, there's a lot of preparation involved in this, right? But seriously, he did a, he did a wonderful job again yesterday. And uh, I, I, I tease him. He teases me. But I don't know what we'd do without him. He's, uh, he is an amazing, talented guy. And... Uh, and And, and sometimes a royal pain in the butt, but go ahead.
Thank you, Dawn. With no words, God's glory is seen in the blueness of the sky, in the breaking wave of the ocean. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, God speaks in sunsets, whispers in roses, laughs in dolphin leaps. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and all creation sings for joy. Good morning. morning. We're going to sing a little medley, and uh, there are two songs you you know, so if you'll rise and sing with me. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty. Gracious God, we come desiring to know true joy. We long to love and to be loved, to dare to hope again, to feel our hearts quicken with anticipation of truly living. Lead us in your ways of love, that we will bear the fruits of a life with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Searching God, we have wandered from home, gone off looking for something, some vague longing, something that thrills or excites, something that takes away this empty gnawing inside. We have wandered far, gotten lost, given up ever finding that which satisfies. Loving God, you have been with us in the search. You have beckoned us home. You have forgiven us and prepared a table for us. And all heaven rejoices. Thank you for seeking us again and again. Amen. Jesus gave us the most extravagant gift of all, the offering of himself for us. Through this selfless gift, we are now set free and our sins are forgiven. One bread, one body, one Lord of all, one cup of blessing which we bless and we though many throughout the earth we are one body in this one Lord Gentile or Jew Our blessed Savior Jesus Christ instituted the holy communion of his body and blood, that it might be the abiding memorial of his atoning death, the seal of his perpetual presence in the church through the Holy Spirit, the mystical representation of the sacrifice of himself upon the cross, and the pledge of his undying love for his people to the end of time. The celebration of the Lord's Supper has ever been regarded by the church as the innermost sanctuary of the whole of Christian worship. We have to do here not with signs merely, but with the realities that these signs represent. Gathering about his table, we profess our desire to be numbered among his people and to walk in his ways. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, to your throne of grace, to this altar, we bring the broken loaf and the fruit of the vine, and we ask that you would prepare them as we receive them, and that you would prepare our hearts so that we might truly remember the one who sacrificed his life, that we might be free, that we might inherit eternal life with him. Allow the meaning and the meat of this wonderful meal, this sacred gathering, to touch our hearts at the deepest of levels, so that as we leave the table, we leave knowing that we have been with him. But we pray these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and having blessed and broke it, said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, after supper, he took a cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament or the New Covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Lord Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, for all things are now ready. bread which we break is not to us the communion of the body of Christ. Take and eat.
The cup of blessing which we bless is not to us the communion of the blood of Christ. Drink ye all of it. Thank you. We have a plethora of uh, prayer shawls today, so I need some ladies to play, or gentlemen, or whatever, come and help us, please. Okay, so there are actually six. Yes. Oh, I, th I said five. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Okay, this one is for Russ Anderson, and uh, he's from up in Michigan, and he is uh, Mary's son-in-law. And uh, Mary requests this. He had, a, he had a stroke. And this is one of those cases where I remember them young and vibrant, and I can't believe they would be sick, you know. So let's hold this uh, for Russ. This one is for um, Ron Diderato. Did I say that right? And uh, has pancreatic cancer, and uh, we want to pray for him. This is for Karen Kellogg. She was recently diagnosed with cancer. Karen. Karen, there you are, Karen. And this one is for Tracy Curtis, who's got stage four ovarian cancer. I want to pray for her. And that's, yeah, the, Karen is a, Mary's daughter's best friend. And this one is for Dave Miller, who's a friend of the Stintons, and he has cancer. Let's do this. Oops, got there. You got it? Okay. And this is for Dave's wife, Donna. And uh, she's had a series of deaths in her family, and, and we need to lift her up, and hopefully this will help. Okay. Can we bring them all together here so we can touch them all? All right. Gracious Heavenly Father, we don't pretend that there's any magic in these prayer shawls. We understand that they're simply a bridge, a touch between us and those who are hurting we pray that as they receive this gift of our love and our prayers and all that it represents, that they would know that there is hope, there is possibility, that there is not only the love of fellow human beings and fellow Christians, but there is the love of a Heavenly Father who cares for them. May these prayer shawls represent all of that and more. May they be blessed by receiving them, blessed by the touch of them, and be encouraged in you. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Not only do we pray for uh, folks that are going through tough times as they're entering into that process, but we also ought to pray a, a prayer of praise and thanksgiving when people are getting better and things are looking up, and that's kind of happening this morning because we've got uh, our girl back from, uh, oh gosh, how long were you down with that? Yeah, how long was it? Like a month or two months or two months, yeah, yeah, so um, we are... We prayed and, uh, in church, we prayed at home, we prayed for, at the hospital, we pray, prayed for you, and you, you, uh, you, came, you came through for us, and we're, we're so very, very happy and so very grateful. Um, we've got a lot of people down with COVID again, and uh, sore throats and, and uh, 
illnesses that Jesse and uh, I just start mentioning names. I'll forget somebody, but uh, a lot of tough things. But um, please, please continue to pray for people each day when you say your prayers. Uh, even if you don't know their name, just pray for those people in your church family who are going through these these uh, awful uh, tough times and uh, and help them uh, by your prayers. From Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 12 and 13. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me and find me with all your heart. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you've heard us pray for all of these people who we've dedicated a prayer shawl to. You've heard us call out to you privately, individually, for those that are on our hearts as we sit here in your sanctuary. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to hear the cries of our hearts. We ask you to reach out and touch those who are sick, encourage those who are down. Hear us as we praise you for healings and strength and encourage us along the way. Today, Heavenly Father, we not only pray for these, but we pray for our nation, for all the confusion and the angst and the anger and the hate and division that seems to plague us lately. Allow it to go away. Allow leadership to rise up and show kindness and love and bring people together in unity and peace. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our church during these uh, days of transition. Allow us to know that you have built, you have provided, you have continued us along the journey, and you will not abandon us. For all that has begun, for every seed that has been planted, you will allow the plants to grow to be watered, to be fed by the sun, to be nourished. For all that you have done, Father, we are truly, truly grateful. And for all that you are yet to do, we look forward with great expectancy. In the name of the one who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time we'll call upon the ushers to receive our morning tithes and offerings.
Heavenly Father, for the great abundance that you have given to us, for all the needs that you have met, for all the times along the way that you have taken our hand and helped us through. We give you thanks and praise and honor and glory in the name of Christ. And we ask that you would dedicate these gifts and use them to the furtherance of his work and kingdom. We pray these in his name and for his sake. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture this morning is from Romans 15, 1 through 13. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us, each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs may be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, I will sing the praises of your name. 
Again it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will bring up one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the word of the Lord. Don't you just feel like you wish you could applaud? <laughs> if you come here from Texas, we make exceptions for you. <laughs> yeah, you, you can come back anytime. Whenever you get tired of Texas, this is your home. May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean upon his name. Paul describes Jesus Christ as our hope in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, it says that Jesus Christ is the blessed hope. In our world and in our time and in the life that you and I are living in this culture, we desperately need hope. Hope is in short supply. In our own personal lives, it's hard to hope when you get a bad diagnosis or you're going through a, a tough time with an illness or a disease. As you read the newspaper, you listen to the news, it's hard to hope that somehow we can turn the corner and get out of the mess that we're in and straighten all of this out. When we think about the world our children and grandchildren are going to inherit and the life they're going to have to live, it's really hard to hope for them and to believe in a, in a good world and a good possibility for them. The hope we have, the only hope we have, in a world that is fading away from him, in a world that is backing away from him, 
when churches are closing, and not opening, but closing, when they are giving up their first love and, and trying to survive with projects and programs and multiplication and numbers, and the only hope that we have is being backed away from, we need Jesus more than ever. For the believer, there is hope beyond the grave, Billy Graham said. Because Jesus Christ has opened the door to heaven for us by his death and resurrection. That resurrection power that we talk about on Easter when we paint the Easter eggs and eat the chocolate candy and sing the old hymns that are Easter songs. Sometimes we forget exactly what hope is generated by that rolled away stone and that empty tomb by the power that's been demonstrated by the Son of God over death itself. We forget that if he could beat death, he can beat anything. If he can take care of the worst enemy that we face, the thing that we fear the most, physical death, then he can beat our bad political systems and he can beat our economic problems, he can beat our financial woes, all of it. If you can beat death, you can beat anything. Hope is found in, in the promise of God, and the promise of God is Jesus. The promise of God is not a denomination, not a particular church or brand, not what you believe, not your doctrinal statement. The promise of God is one thing and one thing alone, Jesus. The Bible did not ask you to etch upon your heart your church's faith statement. It did not ask you to etch upon your heart the key founder of your church. And yet, you know, we go to a Lutheran church and a Methodist church and, you know, they're named after founders. We go to the Jesus church. We want him written on our hearts by him and him alone will we find hope and peace. 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 14, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Not, I hope I get in. I'm trying to be good enough to get in. I, I, I've tried my best to get in. No, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if he is your Lord and your Savior, if, if you have come to him for salvation and then you are walking under his Lordship, if you will do that, you can know, not hope, not surmise, not guess at, you can know that you have eternal life. It isn't a chance thing at all. The hope is inside of you. The hope that's inside of you ought to affect everything you do and say. Everything you experience. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. A living hope. Not some intellectual process. Not something you studied in Bible study. Not something that you got from memory verses. But a Jesus who is real. A Jesus who is your best friend. A Jesus who you talk to while you're driving down the road. And you go into one of those traffic circles. And some screwball old person cuts you off. That Jesus. Somebody who's real. That you talk to. Who knows you. You don't need fancy words or fancy prayers or theological statements. You just talk to him. The Bible says speak to him, the, that we spoke to, Moses spoke to God like a man speaketh unto his friend. That's how we also ought to speak to Jesus, like he is our various best friend. The old hymn says, what a friend we have in Jesus. Is he our friend? Is our hope? built on him. That old hymn again says, my hope is built on nothing less or nothing more than Jesus' blood and righteousness. By the blood of Christ, by the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross, by his death for you, 
He pays the price. He buys your hope for you. You never need to worry again when you accept and you, you take that hope that is the cross and you take it to yourself and trust in it for your eternal salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. Now, there's always this confusion about, you know, well then, does that mean I don't have to do anything? Apparently there are a lot of church folks that think that way. But your faith does not mean you don't work, but you can't work your way to faith, if you can understand that. This verse goes on to say, for we are his workmanship. In other words, we are the result of his work, of his process, of his sacrifice. You're going to heaven not because of what you have done, not because of your rosary beads or your doctrinal statement or how you were baptized or what your parents believed, but you are going to heaven because of Jesus and only because of that. If you believe in him, it says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. In other words, you're going to heaven. And you didn't do a thing except believe. Believe in him. This verse goes on to say, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So in other words, once we come to him, there's where the good works come in. He does the work. He pays the price. He brings you into the kingdom. And then because of that, in response to that, you become part of that kingdom. And the kingdom works. The kingdom works. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. My dad always taught me you have not because you work not. <laughs> if you will come to him, you will want to work. It will be your, your pleasure, your honor to do what needs to be done to further the work of the church and the kingdom and to bring more people to a saving knowledge of Christ. And you don't need to do it by being preachy. You don't need to do it by handing out tracts on the street corner. And all those things are fine. But you can love people into the kingdom. You can represent Jesus Christ in their midst. I mean, some people are are so full of spirituality and so full of religiosity that they scare the living hell out of me. What you want is somebody who shows you that this is real, that Jesus is real, that Jesus is love, that in Jesus I can have hope. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 18 say, So we do not lose heart. Watch the 11 o'clock news tonight and try not to lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So if your outer self, if you looked in the mirror this morning and your outer self is wasting away, there's hope. There's hope in Jesus. Because it is your inner self that is eternal. The rest of this clay, we already figured it out. It's gone. But that inner core, your spirit, your, your soul, that is eternal if it is rested in Christ. For this light momentarily affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For this thing, these things are, that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Anybody ever say to you, yeah, can you prove that God exists? Can you show me God? Can you show me love? Can you show me honor, respect? Can you show me what, what generates service in the heart of a serviceman or a nurse or uh, a police officer or somebody who gives their life over to serving the community. What is it? Is that something you can see? It's not the badge that they wear or the uniform that they put on or the strutting that they teach them to do. It's none of that. It's their heart. It's their spirit. It's the things you can't see. When a couple is married, they pledge love to one another. That love is not seen. 
That love is unseen if it's going to be real. John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14 say, Jesus said to her, meaning the woman at the well, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. To eternal life. You see, there is hope. There is hope because of Christ. And to acquire that hope, to look at the world through different glasses, to see it clearly, you need to have Christ in your heart. It isn't just churchiness. It isn't just some kind of a, a thing that you're expected to say because you're in church. It's something that you, you need to live. Church turns people off often. Church people, preachers, the theological stuff can turn more people away from Christ than the devil himself. What will draw people to Jesus is your heart, your love, your giving without expecting, your being kind when you don't really feel kind, but you know you must because Jesus would be kind. Like that old book, In His Steps, written by a congregational pastor way back when. In His Steps used to ask the question, what would Jesus do? In every situation, in everything that faced them, whether they were sick, whether they were faced with a challenge of what to do in a relationship, it was, what would Jesus do? If you follow in his steps, you'll ask yourself that question over and over again. And sometimes you don't hear the voice, sometimes it's not even the still small voice, sometimes it's, it's be quiet for long enough to get the answer, but the answer will come. Or you will know in your heart, instinctively, because of your relationship with him, what the right thing is to do. You won't have to look it up in the Bible. You won't have, and that's nothing wrong with that, but you won't have to do that because you'll know. You'll know that you know that you know. Is your hope in the wrong power? Is your hope in a political party or a political candidate? Do you know how many families there are right now who are split and fighting with each other over which presidential candidate they think is the right one? They're so vehement about this. They're angry. They're vitriolic with each other. It's just awful. And think about all the presidents we've had in our lifetime, Republican and Democrat. And think about the way that this country is right now. Do you honestly think that one person or another is going to change all that, change our direction, all of a sudden change the hearts of every American, take away the greed, take away the lack of caring for one another, take away the prejudices, take away the divisions? Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Not because of the leadership of anybody. Republican or Democrat or independent or otherwise, it's only going to come. The only power that's going to change this world and this nation is the power of Christ. When this nation comes to Jesus, when the church comes back to Jesus, all things will become new. In these final hours in history, his return ought to infest our faith. We ought to believe every day. We ought to wake every morning and listen to the happy Goodman singing in your head like I do. What a beautiful day for the Lord to come again. What a beautiful day for him to take his children home. I can almost see his face and touch his nail-scarred hand. What a beautiful day for the Lord to come again. So, are you a a Catholic or a Protestant? Are you an evangelical or a progressive? A Mormon, a Seventh-day Adventist, a Methodist, a Lutheran, or worse yet, a Congregationalist? <laughs> or are you a Jesus person? Are you a Jesus freak? Are you in a relationship with the Savior, with the Creator of the world, 
with the one who loves you and will never forsake you. No matter how bad you mess up, no matter what you've done wrong, everybody else will judge you, even though they didn't read that part of the Bible that says, judge not lest you be judged, for surely as you judge, so shall your Father in heaven judge you, even though they've never read the Lord's Prayer, which tells you that if you judge somebody else, God's writing it down, and he's going to judge you by that same standard you just set. But boy, but people will judge you left and right. But Jesus will love you out of that sin. Jesus will make things better. You put your hand in his, you walk with him, and I'll guarantee you everything will be all right. Jesus is coming for his church. He's coming, the Bible says, for the church which is viewed in the scriptures as a bride. And he's coming as the bridegroom for his bride. He's coming for this bride without spot or wrinkle. Why hasn't he come yet? Because take a look at the church. Would you come for a bride that looked like that? Seriously. The reason Jesus isn't back here right now, the kingdom isn't established, is the bride is not a beautiful bride in a beautiful white gown and just as gorgeous as my bride was on the first day. No, because the bride, the church, right now is a street whore. The bride right now is ugly. The church is not doing what it ought to be doing. It's not winning people to Jesus. It's not reaching out in mission. It's not doing what it needs to do to be that beautiful bride. To have that sweet heart. To have that loving way. To take away that judgmentalism. To know when to speak and when to keep its mouth shut. When we become the church... When the church, not just individuals, but when the church becomes washed in the blood of Christ, when the division walls are broken down, when people stop trying to be better than each other, when numbers stop being the God and Jesus starts being the God, when that happens, the trumpet will sound, the eastern sky will break, and the Lord will come. I have a picture in my office of Jesus coming on this great white horse and uh, I hope I can live to see that day if I don't live to see it I'll be right behind him on some old nag but I'm going to follow him here Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father but by me this world doesn't get straightened out by any man only by him we have no hope other than Jesus. Forget all that denominational stuff, church stuff. Forget what mommy and daddy taught you. You're not a Congregationalist. You're not a Lutheran. You're not an Episcopalian. You're not a Catholic. You are Jesus' property. And if that's not true, then you are in the wrong place and you need to get it straightened out. It is not by might, it is not by power. But by my spirit, says the Lord. Your hope must be built on nothing less. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then be in him found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. He is coming, and there is that hope. So next time you become hopeless, let the hope of the world live and become alive in your heart. Heavenly Father, we need so much for Jesus to become real. We need so much to return to him as a church, as individuals, as a world. He is going to rule and reign. It is your plan. It will happen in your time and in your plan. We want to be part of that. We want to be part of singing around the throne and worshiping the Lamb. We want to be part of lifting him up and letting the whole world know that peace has come, that goodness and righteousness is reigning at last, that Jesus is Lord. Pray these things in his name and for his sake. Amen.
We're going to change something because I messed up again, again. Um, I, last night I had in the program for us to uh, sing, um, I believe, in a hill called Mount Calvary, and we were all ready to do that. Kevin got everybody ready to do it, and so uh, we, we sang that last night, and now here it is again in, in your bulletin uh, because I, like I said, I put it two places at once, which just goes to show you that if anybody needs hope, I do. <laughs> but uh, we're going to sing something different. But I know you know this, and the words are going to be up there. We're going to do Because He Lives, which is my second favorite song. So let's do it. God sent his son They called him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He lived and died To buy my pardon An empty grave is there To prove my Savior lived
pray because we're getting some great results from our prayers, and we also have a lot of people who really need our prayers. Uh, Carol Brooks is a living example that it works. She's here, and we're glad to have her here. And, uh, continue to pray for the Tomberlin family. Uh, Brother Roland passed away just a couple weeks ago now, and uh, they're here, and we're glad you're with us this morning. Uh, have a great week again. Don and I thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all your kindness during this uh, 50th anniversary thing. And uh, as much fun as it was and as wonderful as it was, nobody is happier that it's over than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so thank you. And by the way, I, I, want, I, I mentioned it in passing last night. Uh, you all were so kind to, to take up a collection or something for us and gave us a check, which uh, uh, Jim Reed did such a great job last night with all of the things he had. We, we really can't take that. Uh, we take very good care of us, and, and uh, we would feel weird about taking it. So uh, uh, and we're, <laughs> fine, we're fine. So what we want to do, or what we're going to do with it, is give uh, this four thousand dollars. Two thousand dollars is going to go to the uh, Martin Luther King Scholarship Fund, and the other two thousand is going to go to Clothe the Kid, which is part of our Love In program. So uh, if you all, in your gift, help. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.